Um, I get to talk to you this morning very briefly about the role of the team. Um, who, who works on an MS team? Who's on an MS team right now? Okay, so those of you who are on an MS team, you know, I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, but I really just want to point out some um, differences of how we usually think of a team and how that works in chronic illness, particularly in the disease of MS. So we have a lot of challenges. One, because we don't yet have a cure for MS. So we're dealing with a chronic illness that's often progressive. And the courses are variable. You can say, all right, well, I had five MS patients last year, but all five of them were different. So how do I bank on my experience? How do I develop a plan of care when I may not know where this person's gonna be in six weeks, six months, or six years. So that's certainly a challenge. And there's a lot of invisible symptoms. When Colleen was going over that list, if I walk out to the lobby with my, to get my new patient and I see them sitting there, I can't tell by looking at them how bad their fatigue is, if they're having bowel and bladder issues, if they're um, having sensory symptoms. So, you know, there's a lot of things that aren't over. If you're using, if you're working in an ortho clinic and you go to get your patient, they've got a knee brace on and they might have crutches and then you're like, oh, okay, I, I see why you're here. But with an MS patient, there's a lot of things that are under the surface that you don't see. So your interviewing process is really important. Um, I don't live with a chronic illness, but uh, I think that it would be very challenging emotionally if I did. There's a lot of anxiety and psychosocial issues, you know, not only for the person living with MS, but the family and, and friends and their community around them because they have this, you know, underlying fear is tomorrow the day I'm going to wake up and I won't be able to move my legs. Um, is tomorrow the day that I'm going to wake up and I'm going to have that pain symptom that I didn't have before that I have now. So there is a lot of anxiety related to this. And the laundry list of issues might be, you know, an arm length long, and we have to be able to prioritize, see what the patient wants and needs, and be able to kind of lock that down on what's most important to them. And then, of course, there is a lot of lack of understanding. I still get, when somebody says, oh, what do you do? I say, I work in MS. They go, oh, you work with Jerry's kids. You know, they think it's muscular dystrophy. So, you know, there's still a lot of ignorance about MS and what it is and who it affects and even if it's contagious or if it's terminal. So um, there's a lot of education yet to be done. So um, please don't be offended if your discipline is not up here. <laughs> we respect all disciplines. So, um, but there's only so many stars that we can put on that arms of the star. So, you know, dietitian isn't up here, rec therapist isn't up here. But I put this up here just to, I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> we'll be right in votes. Um, uh, to show you that, you know, the patient and the family are at the center of this and they're most important. And not all of these professionals, or the ones that I don't have listed, are in on the case at any given time. They may be, but they'll come and go. So, you know, you might be seeing the urologist and the issue is resolved or managed and then they'll leave and then, you know, so different team members come on and off the team. So I put this picture up here because I really love it. When I came out of school a billion years ago, um, I, my first job was um, in an acute care hospital. I was working uh, in the outpatient unit. And um, it was very clear that if the person had anything wrong with the legs, the PT handled it. And if there was anything wrong with the arms, the OT handled it. Anything from the neck up was the speech pathologist territory and nobody touched the trunk. It was the no man's land. <laughs> nobody did anything for the trunk. So I'm happy to say that this is not the team approach that we have and I'm glad that, that the, a lot has changed since then. Uh, but I have to laugh because, you know, I was, I, heaven forbid if I did a standing activity that involved like something in the kitchen, I would get reprimanded for that. So anyway, enough of that. <laughs> So we have a lot of shared resp responsibilities with this, this MS uh, care team. And I'm not going to go through them um, all, but I want you to be thinking about that when you're taking care of an MS patient, there isn't anything that you should say, uh, not my area, can't, can't handle it. You know. Now you may not be the expert in that area, 
but you want to refer them appropriately. And then you also want to learn because it's so important that these folks get the same information from the entire team. You know, So if uh, uh, Colleen is counseling them about bowel and bladder issues, I need to know what she's telling them so that I can reinforce that in a session. You know? And you know, one, one uh, issue can cross all disciplines. So let's take, because fatigue is so common, you know, fatigue might affect their ADLs and it'll affect their walking and it'll affect their ability to voice by the end of the day. And you know, when they're fatigued, they might have more spasticity, so they might have more bladder issues. So we as the team have to be talking to each other to make sure that we are giving the same information in every session um, of every discipline. So that's really important that we're constantly learning from our teammates. Um, and we're gonna talk about that. So the cases are very complex. You know, if you've worked in MS, it's like, holy cow, I just went through my evaluation and there's problems with this and this and this. Um, but that's the beauty of a team, you know. I, and I know it's an overstated cliche, but it, it does take a village. If you think that you can manage an MS client by yourself, I'm here to tell you that you're wrong. Or if you do it, you'll do your best, but you may not hit on everything that that individual needs. So the team concept is really, really important. Um, and what the client, what the individual with MS and their family want is what we should be doing for them. So our hospital system kind of went to this patient first um, logo or, or um, motto. So it's all about what the patient wants. And even though I might think, oh, this patient should really be working on stair climbing because they live on the second floor, if they tell me the most important thing for them is to get up and down off the floor because they want to play with their grandkids, I better be working on floor transfers, okay? So that's really, really important. The team has to collectively work together to solve problems and to work on the goals. So just because I work with an occupational therapist who has set some goals, I need to know those goals so I can help reinforce it. The speech pathologist, the nursing goals, everything is my responsibility also. It's not just my goals, it's everybody's goals. We're always looking for best practice. That's why you're here today, to learn a little bit more about best practice. And the treatments and the team approach makes it more efficacious. We can get a lot more done in a less amount of time when we're all working together and we're on the same page. So I'll review this really quickly because we throw out a lot of terms and um, you know, multidisciplinary is something that we say uh, a lot, but it may not be really what we're doing. So unidisciplinary uh, disciplinary is usually like the physician's in charge, he manages everything, there's no rehab referrals, there's no, he just takes care of everything, he or she. Um, so we've gone from that type of model to what we've called the multidisciplinary model. But multidisciplinary is still not the ideal model for chronic care. So, you know, there are multiple disciplines, but they're working more on little, like, islands by themselves. Okay, so there might be some communication, but it's not well coordinated. So then we move to this interdisciplinary model, which is a lot better. So there's more communication, there's more uh, collaboration. But really what we want to be calling ourselves is transdisciplinary, so that the discipline's roles are more permeable. Now, I'm never gonna say that we're practicing outside the scope of our practice, but I wanna know what Colleen's doing, and I wanna know what Tracy, the occupational therapist, is doing, and I, so that I learn from them, and I can take some of their skills that they're working on and incorporate them in my sessions. So really, you know, when we say, um, you know, what's ideal on a team, it would be transdisciplinary, especially for anybody working in chronic care. So what do we want in this team? Lots of talking, talk, 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 talk to each other. Um, and we've got lots of ways to do that. I'm fortunate enough to work in a center where all the team members are right in the same location. But if you're not, you know, texting, email, phone conferences, uh, scheduling in-person um, uh, team meetings, great. 
Um, we want to be able to share our knowledge with each other. So, you know, at our team meetings, uh, like our occupational therapist is also lymphedema certified. So she, and I don't really know that much about lymphedema, but she has some of our patients who are in wraps. So, you know, she's teaching us about what that means and what we should be looking for. Uh, commitment to collaborate. So we're open to co-treating. We're open to team meetings and, and sharing. And uh, last but not least, the ability to ask for help uh, and not feel minimized. So, you know, um, we don't know everything. And it's good to be able to ask lots of questions of your teammates and for them to be able to share that with you in an environment that's really safe, that you feel uh, respected in its tr a trusting environment. So, so in summary, <laughs> we're looking for a team that's a holistic team. Uh, not individuals and not this uh, uh, compartmentalization of services. Uh, we're looking at things to be integrated. We don't want to be so closed off that we're just protecting our profession. And again, I want to reinforce that, you know, we're not practicing outside the scope of our practice, but we're ability, our ability to share knowledge and to talk freely with our teammates and share information that's going to benefit the patient and that everybody has an equal seat at the table. The physician is not higher than the dietitian, than the neuropsychologist, than the PT, OT. Everybody has equal equality at the table. So there's parity among all disciplines. Uh, and the last thing that I just want to mention, um, because I get questions a lot about this, is you know, you're dealing with a chronic illness that's often progress progressive. So how do you set goals? Um, certainly, you know, a lot of the goal setting comes from what the patient, uh, patient's goals are. Um, but, you know, writing uh, achievable and realistic goals in a chronic illness that might be progressive is really sometimes very challenging. Um, so, you know, you have to start thinking about <laughs> out, out of the box. You know, a lot of times we're looking at um, safety issues, we're looking at caregiver training, which are very uh, reasonable and um, uh, acceptable goals. And yes, I did use the M word up there, which is maintenance. Um, maintenance in a disease that's awful, often progressive is a positive thing. So, you know, we have a lot of discussions in the states about being able to do um, some maintenance therapy for our patients to keep them at a certain level so that they don't decline. You know, a lot of the uh, research is showing now that uh, not only is uh, uh, some of the deconditioning and some of the weakness and uh, endurance loss in our patients, it's not necessarily due to the disease itself, but because of their deconditioning. They're more sedentary. They're, you know, not getting up. They're not taking care of their health and wellness. So um, uh, getting them on a good home program is, is really important. Um, so... Um, I think that's all I have to say right now. So is there any questions right now before I turn it over uh, to Lacey? I hope this was helpful when you go back to your clinic to see if, uh, you know, there's something different that you can do with your team and, and make it a little bit more uh, transdisciplinary. <laughs>